أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد أحباب المصطفى عليه الصلاة والسلام First things first السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ما شاء الله I can tell dinner was good today Before I begin with what I want to share with you guys this evening, Brother Ferry was asking if I can give you guys the questions ahead of time so you can start brainstorming. Here's question number one for today. Can anyone guess the topic of our discussion this evening? Cricket. Naam? Cricket? 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 No, 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 no. Time, an idea, good. Boxing, Boxing. well, this will be another day, not today. <laughs> No, not today. Did you enjoy the fight, Sheikh, last week? Well, I, I was entertained. I enjoyed my night. It was good. Anybody else want to guess? Rizka, what's the topic today? Excellent, mashallah. Rizka is too advanced. Mashallah. Reflections on Surah Al Asr. Right? Reflecting on the meaning, inshallah, of Surah Al-Asr. Surah Al-Asr is one of the greatest surahs in the Qur'an. It contains three ayat, so it is tied to be the shortest surah in the Qur'an. The shortest surah in the Qur'an has three ayahs. Which surahs have three ayahs, guys? Surah Al-Asr, what else? Surah Al-Kawthar, what else? There's one more. Don't say Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. It does not. <laughs> it does not have three ayahs. What else? You guys figure it out. One half of one part-time half of should be easy. Al Kawthar we got. Surah Al Asr we got. There's one more. Arif <laughs> Lami. I'll give you guys a hint. It's in the last 10 surahs of the Quran, obviously. <laughs> surah Feel, no. Surah Feel is way more than three. It's not Surah Feel, it's not Falaq, it's not Nas, it's not Ikhlas, it's not Feel, it's not Ma'un, it's not Kafirun. Surah Quraysh is one of them, Ahsan. And there's one more. I forgot about the other one. Surah Quraysh. Surah Kawthar, Surah Al Asr, and Surah Al Nasr, Ida Ja'a Nasrullahi wal Fatih, is three ayahs. Ida Ja'a Nasrullahi wal Fatih, Wara Eight and Nasa Yad Huluna Fi Din in Lahi of Waja, Sabbih Behamdi Rabbika was Tafurhu in Nahu Kanatawaba. Many people don't know about Surah Al Nasr. Why? Because Surah Al Nasr is three ayahs, but it's a little bit long. Sorry, yes, a little bit long, right? Surah Quraysh is a line and a half. Surah Kawthar, a line and a half. Surah Al Asr, two lines. Ida Ja'a Nasrullahi wal Fat, unfortunately, three lines. So people think it's too long. This is the problem. Uh, Rizqa, what surah do you read in Salah most often? Huh? Baqarah. He, he didn't memorize Baqarah. What, what do you read? Safat. Wow. What? Was Safat is Safa, Fazajra, Tazajra, Fatariati Dikra, Allahu Akbar after that? <laughs> Most people read Surah Al Asr, Surah Al Ikhlas, Surah Al Kawthar. If somebody is advanced, Surah Al Nasr, right? 
Falak, and the one who is most generous, Surah Nasus, six ayah, they'll split it into two, half and half in Maghrib. Tayyip. Al Muhim, inshallah, the topic of this evening's halaqa is reflecting on the meanings of Surah Al Asr. I thought this is a very good topic for the middle of summer, right? For a good summer halaqa while the weather is good and, uh, you know, we are enjoying a long weekend. Why not reflect on something that we are very familiar with and we read very often? I'm just joking. There is not that much philosophy behind why I chose this topic. The reality is, let's be frank, I was not prepared to talk about the fiqh of salah. So I was driving here saying, what is the easiest thing we can come up with that we can speak about that will be beneficial for everyone? This is what I came up with. Imam al-Shafi'i alayhi rahmatullah famously said about Surah Al-Asr, لَوْ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ حُجَّةً عَلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ إِلَّا هَذِهِ السُّورَةِ لَكَفَتْهُمْ What does that mean? Sayyidina Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, had Allah not sent anything as an evidence upon his creation other than Surah Al-Asr, it would have been enough for them. Surah Al-Asr is enough as a source of guidance for humanity. In the words of Imam al-Shafi'i, and it has how many ayat? Three ayat. How many lines in the Mus'haf? Two lines. How easy? So easy. The youngest of the children has memorized Surah Al-Asr. Let's reflect on the meaning, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal-Asr. Allah swears by al-Asr. What is al-Asr? Al-Asr is a period of time. Okay? It's a period of time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by many things in the Qur'an. As the creator of everything, he subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he wants to make a point, he takes an oath by something that is important. As human beings, as creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we want to emphasize our point, we cannot swear by anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This is something important. I'm not sure about in you guys' culture. But even in some Muslim cultures, unfortunately, people have the habit to swear by things other than Allah. So somebody can swear on their mom's grave or their dad's life or other things. And it's not part of the Islamic practice. As Muslims, if we need to take an oath, if we need to make a qasim, if we want to emphasize a statement, we swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This can be done in a number of ways. The most obvious and easy one is for someone to say, Wallahi. Somebody can swear in other ways by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, somebody may swear by Rabbul Ka'bah. Somebody may say, Rabbul Ka'bah, something, something, something. Meaning by the Lord of the Ka'bah, I swear this is the truth. Right? But the idea is human beings, we can only swear by Allah. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he wants to magnify the value of something and teach us the importance of something, he swears by something of his choice from his creation. There are many examples. Allah swears by the sun, Allah swears by the night, Allah swears by the daybreak, Allah swears by the star, Allah swears by a whole bunch of things. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by olives and figs and the list goes on and on and on. In this particular surah, Allah takes an oath and He swears by time. I have a question for you guys. What is time? Maybe it's too deep, too philosophical. After the stomach is full, hard to get to that level. But in essence, what is time? When Allah swears by time, what is He swearing by? Is it the clock that we have? Is it our, if I left my watch at home, is it our watches that we wear on our wrist? What is the idea? What is Allah swearing by when He swears by time? Allow me to elaborate. In essence, you and I are time. No, I'm not a clock and you're not a watch. But in essence, the human being is nothing but time. And it's not far-fetched to imagine each of us as effectively a clock. A clock that is ticking, and one day the battery will run out, it will stop ticking. Then our life and our existence is nothing but time. And in essence, we are a portion of time. We are a piece of time. That time might be 50 years, it might be 60 years, it might be 70 years, it might be 100 years, Allah knows best. But you and I are nothing other than a 
piece of time. And eventually our time will run out. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time, yes, there is significance to the value of time. But I want you also to think about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by our life. The fact that my life and your life is just a piece of time, a portion of time. You know the ayah is there in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect us yawm al qiyamah. And I just want you to imagine for one second, you know, somebody who passed away. Even somebody who passed away in the year 2023. Only Allah knows when the day of judgment will happen. So if they lived 80 years, born in the 1940s, died in 2023, and then they sleep in the grave, Allah knows maybe the day of judgment will be in 500 years, 600 years, 1000 years, 2000 years, only Allah knows. Then they will wake up. And then the day of judgment itself is 50,000 years long, as Allah says in the Quran. Uh, what's the ayah, Rizqa? Or Abdul Rashid? There's an ayah in Surah Ma'arij, where Allah mentions the length of the day of judgment. Right? On a day when the length of it, the time of it, will be 50,000 years. So imagine a few hundred years in the grave, 80 years of life on dunya, 50,000 years the day of judgment. When the person will go to speak to Allah, Allah will ask him, how long did you spend on earth? He will say a part of a day between Dhuhr and Asr, or between Asr and Maghrib. Like in an afternoon is the amount of time we spent in dunya. Then in essence, I want you to remember and keep in mind that we are just a piece of time. And when our time runs out, we will run out and we will go back to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Time, the time that we see on our clocks and on our phones, because these days, by the way, this is a funny story for you guys. Once upon a time, many years ago, I was wearing a watch. And I ran into a fellow who asked me the time. And I started to pull out my phone. And he insisted, he said, uh, just check your wrist. I said, I'm already reaching for my phone. I was trying to play it off and get him to forget about the watch. I said, I'm just reaching for my phone, I'll check. He said, no, no, no. Why would you do that? Check your wrist, this older guy. So eventually I had no choice to look at my wrist and then he looked at it and he noticed that I was wearing the watch but there was no battery. The watch looked good and the battery was dead. It went well with what I was wearing, so I wore it. But the point I'm trying to make is, we don't even look at clocks and watches anymore. All of our times are in this phone. We see hours passing by, days passing by, the calendar days change, weeks go by, and eventually we monitor time on our phone. What is the value of time? What is the significance of time? The Prophet ﷺ, he said in an authentic hadith, there are two great ni'mah, two great bounties of Allah, majority of the people are oblivious of. May Allah not make us among them. What are these two major bounties of Allah? Good health and our time. Free time specifically, right? Good health, you see, good health is something that people don't appreciate until so they don't have it. There's very few people who are healthy who take the time to make use of their good health, to thank Allah for their good health, and to do the things that they should be doing while they are healthy. Most people, when they become sick or their health starts to deteriorate, then they say, oh, we remember the days when we were healthy and we weren't sick. The same thing goes for time and free time specifically. People don't use their free time wisely until they don't have time. Then when they don't have time, they start to complain. If only I had time. Brother, why aren't you up to date with anything that you have to do in your life? Wallah, I don't have time. Brother, how is your study of the Qur'an going? I don't have time. I used to have time. I didn't spend the time wisely. Now I don't have time. Brother, how is, uh, you know, did you make it to the masjid this week? Uh, these days, my work schedule, I'm working 12 hours. I don't have time. Then what happened? People don't value time until they lose the time. And this is a good reminder for all of us, maybe more specifically my young friends, but even as adults, you know, if you have free time, use it wisely, use it productively. It doesn't mean that you will sit in the masjid all day. 
But it means that your time, you know, subhanAllah, just like your money, all of us understand that you have money, after a while you should see some value for that money. If I had millions of dollars and I had nothing to show for it, this is a waste. Everybody understands this. If I had millions of dollars, you should be able to see it in the house that I live in, the car that I drive, maybe the type of holiday that I go on, whatever the story might be. You should see some you know, product of that money that I have. When we have time, when we have free time, we should have some product to show for it. If I have time, there should be some skill that I acquire, some knowledge that I attain, some people that I help, some extra ibadah that I do, مثلاً. whatever the story is, however it is that you like to invest your time. The point is, when you have time, there should be some product that you have to show for that time. There's something for all of us to think about. You know, whatever the stage you are in your life, if somebody was to ask you in the last six months, what did you achieve? You should have some answer. Don't tell me I ate breakfast on time every day. I went to school every day. These are things you have to do. There's no option. Don't tell me you made Isha every night. This is something you don't have a choice. But each one of us has some free time that if you use it in something productive, after a period of time, you'll achieve something. And it should be something that we take seriously. I need to ask myself, you need to ask yourselves, what is the product? What is the fruit of our free time? After a year, the whole year of, and let's be very, very easy. Let's assume hypothetically that somebody has one hour of free time a day. Most of us have more than that. Let me ask you guys a question. It's a fun uh, survey. How much free time do you have in a day? Don't, don't tell me none. I don't want to hear anybody say I don't have any free time. How much free time do you have in a day? Instead? Five hours? MashaAllah. Not bad. My number will be close to that. I'll tell you why. Rizka, how much free time do you have in a day? Huh? Whole day. Wow. MashaAllah. I wish I could be in your shoes. Good. I'm too young. That's why. But it's good. MashaAllah. Abdul Rashid, how much free time do you have in a day? 28 hours out of the day? 10 minutes, fair. Okay. A very busy guy, mashallah. Doing what? We'll discuss after the halafa. Sisters, how much free time do you guys have in a day? No, no, haram. Nobody can say whole day by the way other than riska. Right? Because we have things we have to do. We need to make salah. All of us have our responsibility, whether it's you work, um, things you have to do at home. For our, our sisters, you know, it takes lots of time, by the way, to look after the kids, to look after the house, to make sure the place doesn't flip upside down. Lots of effort. But when you put all of that together, if you're somebody who has hobbies, if you work out, if you play soccer, if you watch a sport, put all of that aside. When you're done, how much free time do you have? Sisters? Huh? No, 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 sleep, count sleep. For argument's sake, put eight hours. Somebody once said you're supposed to sleep eight hours a day. I don't know where, what they will achieve in life if they sleep eight hours a day. But how much free time is left at the end, guys? My young sister's in the back. How much free time do you guys have? Five hours, good. Okay, the reason I like the five-hour story, I'll tell you why personally. You guys, most of you, especially if you had Apple phones, I think it was available to you guys before. On Androids and Samsungs, we got this recently. There's this uh, internal app that tracks your screen time, right? How much time you spend on your screen. So my report, my weekly report, states that I spend an average of four hours a day on my screen. That's why when he said five hours, I said, it sounds about right. Four hours on your screen. Now, however you slice it, because this is how I justify it in my mind, right? You say, no, no, we do lots of work. We use our phone for work. We have to do things with our phone. That's why it's four hours a day. But then you go read the details of the report. Where are those four hours a day being spent? On the top of the list, YouTube. Under that, probably WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook. So none of these are work-related. So what happened here? Then in essence, just 
simple, simple. Somebody said one hour in the beginning, so we'll go with that. If I was to cut my screen time from four hours to three hours, forget about cutting anything else in my life. Forget about squeezing time anywhere else. Just limit my time on my phone from four hours a day to three hours. I'm not claiming I did it, by the way, because I saw the report. I think I get mine, I don't know, maybe today, today morning or yesterday night, something like that. I saw it again, four hours and 19 minutes, four hours and 20 minutes. The number doesn't go down. We have to work on it. But if from that four hours you cut one hour, you have one hour of free time a day. 60 minutes is a lot of time. And you multiply that by the whole year, you have 365 hours in a year of free time. Do you know what you could achieve in 365 hours? We can have a new Einstein or a new Newton or a new Imam al-Shafi'i or a new Imam Abu Hanifa easily if people put one hour a day into something productive, to developing their mind, developing their thoughts and you know, acquiring some knowledge and some skills that can be beneficial for humanity. In essence, the point I was trying to make is our time and our free time especially is very, very valuable. And we should develop the mindset of expecting ourselves to achieve something with our time. It's not enough for a Muslim to go through life and year after year, decade after decade, the achievement is, Alhamdulillah, I'm still paying my mortgage. Alhamdulillah, I was never late to pay my bills. Alhamdulillah, I am surviving. It's not enough. Eventually, as time goes on, we have to have some product to show for our time. The same way our money that accumulates, we need to have something to show for it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He swears by time. By the way, all of this is introduction and I have 10 minutes left. Allah swears by time. The oath is important because there's something Allah is swearing by that we need to understand. In this case, it's time. But what comes after is equally as important, which is the remaining two ayahs. What does Allah say? Now that He drew our attention to how important time is, to the fact that you and I are a piece of time and eventually our time will run out, to the fact that one of the most valuable things in our life is our time. Actually, the most valuable thing in your life is your time. Right? Time is the only thing you cannot get back. If you lose some money today, you can make more money tomorrow. If you lose your time today, you cannot get more time tomorrow. I wish there was a way that we can go and purchase time back. Say, yeah, you know, a few years ago, I wasted many, many hours. Can I just buy it back? All of us, most of us at least, would be willing to trade our money for time back. Why? Because you can do with time what you can't do with money. But after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time, what does He say next? Verily, human beings are in a state of loss. And the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generic. Allah is not saying the disbelievers are losers. Allah is not saying the hypocrites are losers. Allah is saying human beings, all of humanity, every single human being is in a state of loss. Why is this? Because every human being's time is ticking. Time is moving. And it's either you're doing something to make sure that your time is not lost and wasted, or you are wasting and losing time. So every human being is in a state of loss. But there is an exception. Allah says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ Allah puts four conditions that people who have these four conditions, they are not losers. They are not losing their time. And it's our goal, inshallah, to make sure that we have these four conditions in our life. If we don't want to be a loser, who likes to be a loser? Nobody wants to be a loser. Allah is saying all of human beings, all of humanity are losers. Except for people who do four things with their time. What are these four things? الَّذِينَ amanu, They have iman. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And they do righteous deeds. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ they cooperate upon truth, they cooperate with other people upon the truth, and they cooperate with other people in patience. They believe, they act righteously, they cooperate with people upon the truth, and they cooperate with people upon patience. Let's break this down. Allah says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Alhamdulillah, we are all believers. All of us have iman. So, number one, check. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except those who do righteous deeds. Alhamdulillah, we are here in the masjid today. We prayed Asr, we're going to pray Maghrib. Then we are doing the righteous deeds, Alhamdulillah. We should continue to do them. 
check. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ To cooperate with other people upon the truth. What does this mean? Your time is wasted. If you are not involved and if you're not busy cooperating with other people in good things. This is very, very important if you think about it. Many a time, those of you who are in the masjid, may Allah bless you, I see all of these faces regularly. And those who are at home, many of you join regularly, may Allah bless you, you're part of the family, part of the community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill your homes with His blessings and with His mercy. But many a time, many a Muslim feels that as long as I pray and as long as I fast, I believe in Allah. My kids, you know, I taught them that we're Muslim. I'm okay, I'm good. But in reality, and believe you me, I've had discussions with my age mates, with young friends of mine, and they ask a critical question. Maybe I told you guys this before. A very unique question. Will Allah punish us if we don't help the masjid, if we don't volunteer in the masjid, if we don't attend these events, if we don't come for these halaqas and family nights and get involved in the masjid? Will Allah punish us? Are we going to Jahannam? We pray, we do what we have to do. So what more could Allah possibly want? The reality is if you want to be successful and if you don't want to be a loser, you have to cooperate. It's part of our tradition, it's part of our deen that we involve in cooperating with other people in good things. The religion of Islam, for me and you to be successful in the eyes of Allah, it cannot work. It doesn't cut it that individually you worship Allah by yourself and you're not actively part of the jama'ah. You need to actively be part of the Muslim jama'ah. What is the Muslim Jama'ah? It's not my movement or your movement or Masjid Istiqlal or any particular you know, tariqah or anything like that. The Muslim Jama'ah is a Muslim community and it varies from place to place. If you live somewhere, the Muslim community might be three, four families in the neighborhood. If you live you know, locally in the GTA, the Muslim community will be your local Masjid. Or if you choose, maybe Masjid Istiqlal as the community that you belong to. But you need to belong to the Muslim community and actively cooperate with the Muslim community in good things. This is part of what is required if you don't want to be considered a loser in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we have a masjid, when we have the house of Allah, and alhamdulillah it's functional, it's open, we have programs, we have events, we have activities, we have people that we need to help. It's my responsibility and the responsibility of everybody who is hearing me and who is watching at home and all of us who are here in the masjid today, it's our responsibility to be involved and to cooperate with the Muslim community to do good things. It is a religious obligation. There's no other way to slice it. People think that this is extra. Well, like the mindset is, the common mindset out there in the street is I am obligated to pray fast and make hajj if I can and pay my zakat. And those people who are free and they have extra time, like the people who maybe are retired, or the young kids, they go to the masjid and they do things together. Most of the, I don't want to be too negative and time is flying, but most of the time if you go to the masjid, alhamdulillah our masjid here is an exception, wallahi. But most of the time if you go to the masjid, who do you find? You find the madrasa program for the little children, starting at the age of five. Typically they taper off by the age of 12, 13, 14 max, if they can, you know, if the parents can drag them. And after that you don't really see many youth teenagers around the masjid. And when you get to the adults generation, who do you find active in the masjid? Usually people who are retired. People who are no longer working full time. It's as if the mindset is when the kids don't, are too young and they have nothing else to do, we take them to the masjid. And when they grow old and there's no longer any work to do, then they go back to the masjid. As I said, here, alhamdulillah, I found out this is not the case. But in many other places, and maybe you guys know, in your local message, go visit the local message and scope with your eye just for the fun of it and see who do you spot around you. The reality is this type of you know, normalism came about because people think that being part of the community, being involved in the community, cooperating with other people and doing goodness is extra. It's something if you have time you do, but it's not the case. It's something that is obligatory, something that is mandatory, unless you want to be a loser. But who wants to be a loser? All of us, our goal in life is to be a winner in the eyes of Allah. And in order to be considered a winner in the eyes of Allah, we need to be, you know, pardon me for overly simplifying, but we need to be plugged in and engaged and involved in the masjid. Somebody may ask, how did you come up with this? 
the Muslim community that its hub and its center is the masjid. There is no other place. We don't have any other center or any other club or anywhere else that we can genuinely claim this is the capital or the center of the Muslim community. The Muslim community stems from the masjid. Then you and I, inshallah, we ask Allah to help us and to keep us steadfast until we die that we are always belonging to the masjid. Not for the sake of belonging to a cult, but for the sake of belonging to the community, being engaged with the Muslim community, being connected to the house of Allah. Wallahi, all the goodness in life comes from the masjid. Talk to anybody who is successful, in this, especially in this world that we live in, in this part of the world where we are a minority as Muslims, people who are successful, who have, mashallah, success in their careers and their worldly aspirations, and also success because they are practicing Muslims, talk to these people and ask them, where did your you know, success and where did your launch pad to achieve what you achieve come from? They'll tell you from the masjid. This is where we were, you know, surrounded by Islam, surrounded by Muslims. This is where we were anchored with our deen. This is where we met good people. Because who do you meet in the masjid, inshallah? Righteous people, honest people, trustworthy people, people you can rely on people who will give you good advice, people who can help you solve your problems. All of this happens in and around the masjid. All of this big lecture to explain what? To explain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear that if we don't want to be losers, we need to cooperate with the other believers upon the truth. And we're saying, where does that cooperation upon the truth happen? It happens in the masjid, inshallah. The last point that Allah made he said, وَتَوَاصَوْ sabr." They cooperate upon patience, or they cooperate with patience. What does this mean? It's very simple. In order to work together and to cooperate with other people, you will need to have patience. It will not work. The community will fall apart if I don't have patience and if you don't have patience. If the imam doesn't have patience to deal with the jama'ah, it will never work. If the jama'ah doesn't have patience to deal with the imam, it will never work. If the board of directors don't have patience to deal with the members, it will never work. If the members don't have patience dealing with the board of directors, it will never work. If the leader of a committee dealing with his members and his teammates doesn't have patience, it will never work. If the elders don't have patience with the youngsters, it will never work. If the youngsters don't have patience with the elders, it will never work. If the brothers don't have patience with the sisters and vice versa, it will never work. So for this whole community to succeed, for us to successfully cooperate with each other upon goodness and upon the truth, we need to have patience. It's a prerequisite for us to be successful working together that we have patience, inshallah. These are some thoughts from Surah Al-Asr that inshallah can be beneficial for all of us. And the hope inshallah is now you can take full permission, read Surah Al-Asr in every salah, no problem. But think about the meaning, inshallah. When you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asr, think about your life. Think about your time. Time is passing. Every moment that goes, time is gone. You'll never get that minute back. You'll never get that hour back. You'll never get that day back. Then what is the product that I have to show for this day? What did I achieve today that I didn't achieve yesterday? What do I have today that I didn't have yesterday? What type of information am I now aware of that I wasn't aware of last year or last week or last month is extremely important. When you read that all of mankind or when you say, you know, Inna al-insana lafi khusr, all of the people are losers. Think to yourself, I am not a loser. I will not be a loser. How to make sure I'm not a loser? To make sure I have iman, to make sure I do the good deeds, to make sure I belong to the Muslim community and cooperate with the Muslim community to do the good things. And to make sure I have patience to deal with the whole Muslim community so that we can work together and cooperate with each other upon the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who listen. And when they listen, they understand. And when they understand, they apply the best of what they understood. I told you guys earlier that I'll be leaving early today. I have guests at my house and I have to run. I promised them that I will be back by 9 o'clock so we can eat dinner. So I will be running out of here shortly. Um, Salatul Maghrib will be led by either Rizqa or Abdul Rashid. They can figure it out. I recommend it. They can play rock, paper, scissors to figure out who does lead the Salah. But I think they didn't like that idea. Yeah, and they, 
The other one gives adhan. Fair enough. I'll tell you guys a funny story and we'll close with this. When I was younger, we were a lot younger in our local masjid at Branton Islamic Center, we used to study. And they had a gym next door. We used to play basketball. Sometimes we converted the basketball court into an indoor soccer field. And we used to play. And we were there, mashallah, alhamdulillah, almost every day. And it used to happen, especially in the summertime, um, you know, Asr time or something on a weekend or whatever, our teacher would not, he'd be busy with his family and whatnot, so he may not make it to the masjid. So one of us, the young boys, some of us have the Qur'an, some of us, you know, already experienced leading Taraweeh and stuff. Some of them still students. It was our job to lead the Salah. And among us, um, we had a problem, which was for years, over and over again, maybe a hundred times, our teacher and the elders in the community told us, that, guys, you stay in the masjid, mashallah, you spend hours in the masjid, you know what time salah is. Then if the adhan is at 6.30, for example, stop playing before the adhan. Go freshen up, make sure you're not sweating, you don't look like an animal. You know, put on some atar or perfume, get ready and come nicely to lead the salah. Especially for the elders, may Allah bless them, you know, they used to be very frustrated. They make the effort, they leave home and they come to a masjid. And what did we used to do as kids? The adhan is going, we still play. And three minutes before the iqama, we stop the game and we run to grab a paper towel, try to wipe the sweat off, throw a thobe on top and go to the musallam. And you find the imam over there sweating, his thobe is wet and he's huffing and puffing. And these guys used to get mad. What kind of salah is this? What kind of imam is this? Looks ridiculous. So what happened, we used to not like to leave. Because of the whole package, we knew that our teacher will get complaints and whatnot. Not we didn't like to lead salah, but in that specific scenario, if we finish the game, it was a fight who has to lead salah. And so all kinds of scenes used to happen where we're entering the masjid, the guys are ready to make iqama and we're fighting with each other, but who gets the lead? They used to get mad. And then one day, two guys, I remember, somehow they ended up being the two who it was between them, they had to lead salah. And they came up with this genius idea. They couldn't agree who was going to lead, so they said, let's do rock, paper, scissors. So they did rock, paper, scissors. One guy lost, another guy won. Then the guy who lost, he's insisting. He's saying, no, two out of three, we have to keep going. <laughs> and this is my luck, because I, uh, I was in the masjid as well. So I remember watching, I'll never forget the sight. All the jama'ah, the elders and the muazzin, and everybody are standing ready, trying to make a khama, waiting for these kids to decide. And they're looking at them, shaking their head like, you know, what, what is the hope for the future of the ummah? Look at these losers. <laughs> so that's where I got the idea from Abdul Rashid and Rizqat to do rock, paper, scissors to figure out who will lead salah. Ahbab, jazakallah khayn for attentive listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. Reminder for everyone, inshallah, we are here tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Right? 8 a.m. inshallah, we have breakfast. And then we will do our Sunday morning halaqa, and then we have our tahsin program as well. Uh, those of you who can make it, come and join us inshallah. It is a long weekend. Come and spend a few moments in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will not regret it. Before I leave, do you guys have any questions or comments for me? Sheikh, what time are you leaving? No, no, no. You're not watching the fight tonight? Maybe. Where is he going? <laughs> Questions, comments, going once, going twice. Tayyib, Jazakallah khair, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. May he open the doors of goodness for us in this dunya and may he open the gates of Jannah for us in the next life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all for our mistakes and shortcomings and may he guide us to that which pleases him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this new Islamic year a year of prosperity, a year of happiness and a year of achievement for us and for the Ummah of Islam. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.